The text for this afternoon is God's, the truth of God's word, as summarized in Lord's Day 49 of the Hollywood Catechism. It's on page 562 of your book of praise. There we confess. What is the third petition? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, grant that we and all men may deny our own will and without any murmuring obey your will, for it alone is good. Grant also that everyone may carry out the duties of his office and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. After the proclamation of God's word, we'll respond by singing the, Lord's, the third petition of the Lord's Prayer. Set the music on hymn 63, stanza 4. Dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to the third petition of the Lord's Prayer this Sunday afternoon. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a lot of interconnections between the second and the third petition, the second being your kingdom come, and third being your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray your kingdom come, we're asking God to be our king. And so we're accepting and submitting to the role of a servant and a subject of God. In the third position, we pray that we may carry out God's will because we are God's servants. Your kingdom come has to do with who we are or who we perceive to be to ourselves. It has to do with our identity. Your will be done has to do with what we do as God's servants. And what we ought to do is outlined in God's law. We'll get back to this shortly. So, it's about what we do as God's servants. What we do should flow from who we are, but this by no means is easy. What the Apostle Paul writes resonates deeply in us. Apostle Paul says he does not understand his own under his actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do, that is what I keep on doing. Isn't that true of ourselves? Perfectly obeying God's law, following Christ in his footsteps, in his perfect obedience, is extremely difficult. Christ himself compared this perfect obedience, the life of perfect obedience, as carrying the cross, a cross. Matthew 16, verse 24, Christ says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Following Christ involved taking up a cross. Historically, this would have been a shocking statement Think of this, Christ said this before he went to the cross, before the cross was a symbol of salvation, before the cross was a symbol of Christianity. The cross was just a symbol of death and torture. There were no cross, no one was wearing a cross as a piece of jewelry. It was just a brute tool of torture and death. You might say Christ in this, in our tech, in our Today, he might be saying, if you're going to follow me, sit in the electric chair. The gory imagery of the cross was meant to convey how difficult it is to obey God's law perfectly and to be the disciples of Jesus. And that's why Christ taught his disciples a powerful prayer and that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, has a powerful petition, the third petition. Your will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. And this third petition is the focus of this afternoon. So the theme of this sermon is 
In the third petition, we ask God to help us become obedient to God's revealed will. In the third petition, we ask God to help us become obedient, more obedient to God's revealed will. We'll consider three points. It's first, it's meaning. Second, it's necessity. And third, it's power. First, let's ask and figure out what we're asking. When we pray, your will be done. Is this prayer purely, as some would call it, a prayer of resignation? Is this prayer an exercise of giving up my own will and resigning my will and accepting God's will? For example, let's say someone is struggling with a serious health issue, a serious illness, and you pray to God for healing, but at the end you make sure that you add, but your will be done. Is that what we're doing in this petition? So what exactly do we mean by your will? What are, we, what are we referring to? And when we talk about God's will, there's at least two options. First, there is God's hidden and secret, secret will. And second, there is God's revealed will. And I put it in the theme explicitly that we're talking about God's revealed will. Well, let's, let me first explain what God's secret or hidden will is. God's secret will is God's plan, or you could say his counsel where everything, good or evil, fits somehow and somehow serves God's ultimate purpose. For example, the way in which Christ secured our salvation through the cross would be part of God's hidden will. It's something that was a mystery. The angels long to look into it. And we see biblical evidence of God's hidden will in first Ephesians 1, verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, there was a first type of God's will, and let's go to the second, part, second type, which is God's revealed will. And that is God's will for our lives. And that's what's revealed to us through his law. We can ask, what is God's will for us when it comes to sexual ethics? God revealed his will to us when he says, you shall not commit adultery. It's right there. It's revealed to us. Same thing, what about our property? You shall not steal, and so on. The distinction between that I just made and I just told you about the first God's secret will and second God's revealed will is a biblical concept. Although you will not find those words in the Bible, the concept is clearly there. We see both of them in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. This being the Calvin's one of his favorite texts. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of, his law, of this law. Secret things and the things that are revealed sounds a bit vague, but notice that it is about God's will, revealed will in his law, because the text goes on and says, the purpose of these things, the revealed things, is that we may obey God's law. So, there is God's secret will, hidden will, and there is God's revealed will. So which one are we referring to when we pray, your will be done? Could it be that we are praying to God that God would carry out his secret will, hidden will? No, that's not what we are praying for. This is what Calvin writes in the Institutes. When he talks about the third petition, we are not here treating of that secret will by which he governs all things and destines them to their end. For although the devils and men arise in tumult against him, he is able by his incomprehensible counsel not only to turn aside their violence, but make it subservient to the execution of his decrees. What we here speak of 
is another will of God, namely that of which voluntary obedience is the counterpart. And therefore, heaven is expressly contrasted with earth because as is said in the Psalms, the angels do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Now, that was dense. And let me explain what Calvin means. When we pray, your will be done, we add, on earth as it is in heaven. When we do that, we're implying that there's a difference between what's going on in heaven and what's going on on this earth. That's why we're praying that things will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. Because there's a difference, we're asking God to close that gap. Now, in order to figure out which will we are talking about, we have to ask, is there a difference between heaven and earth when it comes to God's secret will, or is there a difference between heaven and earth when it comes to God's revealed will? So first, is there a difference between heaven and earth in the degree that God's secret will is done? Does God accomplish his secret will a bit less on this earth than he does in heaven? No, as we heard this morning, God is sovereign both in heaven and on earth. God's hidden will is carried out perfectly both in heaven and on earth. And let me give you an example of this. In Genesis 50 verse 20, Joseph said to his brothers, You meant it. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You know the story of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph's brothers, the sons of Jacob, were involved with human trafficking. They sold their own brother as a slave. That's a horrendous sin, and that's definitely against God's revealed will. But when Joseph's brother went, to, went against God's revealed will, did God's hidden will, was it hindered in any way? No, it didn't. In fact, their sin, you could say, advanced God's purposes. It advanced God's hidden will. This is beyond our understanding of it. That's exactly what Joseph is saying in verse 20. God intended his slavery for the good to save many. What he's saying is Joseph was sold into slavery and he became the vizier, the chancellor of Pharaoh, the servant of Pharaoh, so that he could interpret the dreams, so he could store up grain for seven plentiful years, so that people could have food when there's seven years, when there was seven years of famine. All that was to advance God's, fulfill God's hidden and secret will. So we see that even in the midst of terrible sin, God's will, God's hidden will is being fulfilled on this earth. For another example, you can think of the cross. The cross is where the worst crime in human history happened against our Savior Jesus Christ. Yet what does the Apostle Peter say about it on the day of Pentecost? He says in Acts 2 verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter says, Christ was crucified according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So even there, God's hidden will is not hindered at all. So, there is no difference between heaven and earth when it comes to God's hidden will. God's hidden will is fulfilled perfectly in heaven and also perfectly on earth. So it makes no sense whatsoever to pray your secret will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But how about God's revealed will? How was it when it, in the case of Christ's crucifixion? God's revealed will was most certainly disobeyed and ignored in every way. There it was a lot of difference between what was going on in heaven and on earth when it comes to God's revealed will. As we sang in Psalm 103 in heaven, God's revealed will is perfectly carried out by angels. 
But on earth, God's revealed will is constantly ignored and disobeyed in every way. So it makes sense to pray your will, your revealed will be done as it is on earth as it is in heaven. So in conclusion, when we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying that God's revealed will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On this topic, I know it's been a long argument. There is one serious objection that we have to deal with. What about Christ praying your will be done in the Garden of Gethsemane? Isn't Isn't that a prayer of resignation? Isn't he just accepting God's hidden will? No, it's not. Even there, Christ is not passively accepting God's hidden will for him. He is actively obeying God's revealed will for him. It's true that the exact way that God was going to carry out the salvation or how God was going to bring his people salvation through the cross was kept as a mystery. It was hidden. But that wasn't the case for Christ Christ being a perfect human being, being endowed with the Holy Spirit, perfectly understood the scriptures that it was meant for him to go to the cross. For Christ, suffering on the cross was revealed, or you could even say that it was commanded to him by the Father. It was outlined in scripture for him. For example, just before he went to the Mount of Olives, He said in Luke chapter 22, verse 37, this is what he said in verse 37. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered, and the scripture is that he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. That doesn't sound too hidden, does it? He knew exactly what he was meant to do. He knew what God's will, revealed will, was as it was revealed to him through the scriptures. So, when he prays your will be done, he's actively obeying God's revealed will, and he actively went to the cross. And then we see in verse 39 that he went to the Mount of Olives as was his custom. This shows that God, Christ is actively obeying God's will for him. When he went to the Mount of Olives, he knew that Judah was going to come and find him there because that was his custom. It was as it was his custom. It's what he did routinely. That shows that Christ was actively going to the cross as he went to the Mount of Olives. And there, as he prayed, your will be done, is actively obeying God's revealed will. You could even say that in, while in prayer, he was waiting for his arrest. Sure, it was a unique command just given to Christ only, but nevertheless, it is revealed, God's revealed will for him. So even when Christ prayed, your will be done, he meant God's revealed will be done. That's a big part of what we're praying for when we pray your will be done. And now that's settled, let's see what else we're praying for. If we're saying your reveal will be done and, and, and that we obey God's will more and more as we pray, it implies that first of all that we, should, we know God's will. How can we obey God's will if we do not know God's will? So when we're praying your will be done, we're first of all praying that the gospel may be spread all over the world because it's not, we're not just praying for ourselves, but we're also praying for all men. And the second thing we're praying for in connection to knowing God's will is the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And that's because we know well, all too well that just reading the Bible or being in the earshot of the gospel does not mean that we know God's will. The Holy Spirit must work in us. He must shed light in our minds and grant us understanding 
Only then do we grasp God's will for us. And that's the point of Romans 12, verse 2. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Discerning what is the will of God comes from transformation, the transformation that comes also with the renewal of the mind, which is what the Holy Spirit only can do for us. And after knowing God's will, then comes obedience. This is what we confess in our catechism. Grant that we and all men may deny our own will, and without any murmuring, obey your will, for it alone is good. I think that's straightforward. Then the catechism goes on into a bit more detail. Grant also that everyone may carry out the duties of his office and calling. The reason that the catechism adds, adds this part is because when we think of God's revealed will, what God wants for us in our lives, we, we're quick to think of the Ten Commandments. But there's also specific commands depending on the offices you have and the calling that you have. Think of the office bearers. The minister of the word has a specific task of preaching the word. The elders have the task of shepherding the flock. The deacons have the task of the ministry of mercy. Or you could think of the threefold offices that we all have, the office of prophet, priest, and king. In addition to these offices, our catechism also mentions calling to remind us that there are also other callings. The Ten Commandments applies to everyone, but there are other commandments as well, specifically given to, let's say, slaves and masters. There are other commandments that also applies to us this day, the calling to be fathers, mothers, children, and so on. So this, the catechism reminds us that even in this specific things, in all area of our lives, we can ask God for help with our prayer. And then finally, the catechism adds, as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven, Catechism zooms in to the heart. We can ask God for help so that we can obey willingly and faithfully. Now, considering all that this catechism, all this petition involves, we can see how necessary this prayer is. This prayer is necessary because by nature we are sinful and rebellious. We are by nature inclined to hate God and hate our neighbors. That's why we confess in Lord's Day 44 that even like, no one can keep God's law perfectly in this life. And that's why our catechism mentions denying our own will. It's not as if our will is directed towards the right direction, is aligned with God's will, and then all we need is the strength to follow it through. Now, our will, we're, hate, we're inclined to hate God and our neighbors. That means our direction is, is entirely the opposite to what God's will is. So we need the power to deny our own will. That's exactly what Christ said to his followers, to deny their own will. And that's a painful ordeal. Often obeying God's will, because we have to deny our own will, is difficult, it's unpleasant, it's inconvenient, and demanding. Take, for example, as we become painfully aware of obeying, loving, respecting the government. Doesn't that take so much self-denial? And we often think, I'm so sick of this. I think of bearing each other's burden. Again, an act of self-denial or rejoicing in trial. None of these come naturally to us. And all this without murmuring, willingly. Our natural reaction to all this is to complain and is to grumble and murmur. So we need God's help in all this. The second reason we need this prayer is because God's demand is high. God demands perfect obedience. 
to give you an example, our obedience to God has to be perfect, not only outwardly, but also inwardly. We saw in the 10th commandment that not even the, the slightest desire against God's will should arise in our hearts. God sees what's in our hearts. Outward obedience is not enough. It's not enough for us to come to church, sing songs, close our eyes during prayer, listen to, or stay awake during preaching, go back home, do our work. It might be possible to do that if you're disciplined. It's doable without prayer and without the power of the Holy Spirit. Think of all the monks of different religions and the incredible things that they do, such as maintaining silence for decades, fasting, and other painful things. They don't need the Holy Spirit to do that. They're just disciplined. That's not what God is looking for when he, looks, when he demands obedience. He's not looking for outward obedience alone. He's not trying to see how much boredom and, and pain you can tolerate. And this is clear in the Old Testament. God wasn't merely satisfied, no, satisfied by Israelites merely bringing sacrifices. At times, he found that insulting. God says in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. They were doing the right things outwardly, but it was repulsive to God because their hearts were not in the right place. Just outward obedience, obedience that does not come from thankful hearts, that does not come from loving hearts, is repulsive to God. We also know that because the essence of love, of law, of the law is love, loving God with all our heart, soul, and strength. What God requires from you is willingness. And willing obedience only comes when we love God. That's why the third petition is so necessary. Because we are unable to willingly obey God, and we so often fail to do that, we're asking God to obey Him, that we may obey Him. Help us in obeying Him in a willing and faithful fashion as they are the angels in heaven. Again, this is not something that we can do in ourselves. This is, this is something that God can do in us. God can transform our hearts. He can make our wills come alive. That's why this prayer is so powerful. This prayer is powerful because God answers our prayers. And if you have doubt, any doubt that this is, whether this is true, if you wonder whether it is possible for a human being to obey God's law, willingly and faithfully, like angels in heaven, look to Jesus Christ. He is your evidence. Remember that the life and mission of Jesus Christ was to do God's will. How did he achieve that? By praying, your will be done. Christ wasn't just praying as an example to teach us this is the words that you have to pray. Christ prayed, your will be done, because he himself relied on the Holy Spirit through prayer. Remember that he was truly human. He was made like his brothers in every respect, and he was tempted in every way. He too needed the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember back in the summer, as we were going through the Gospel of Mark, we, when we came to the baptism of Christ, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Anointing points to receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. The office bearers in the Old Testament, the kings, priests, and prophets were anointed by the Holy Spirit because they were given special powers to rule, to prophesy, and so on. And Christ receives the Holy Spirit because he too has to bear 
the burden of God's wrath. He has to go through this life as a human being. He has to bear the wrath of God in his human nature. He too had to walk by faith and not by sight. That said, the way, the only way that Christ achieved his mission was by relying on the Holy Spirit through prayer. And right before he went to the cross, he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And we know the result. We know that God heard his, and answered his prayer. Christ was able to be obedient even to death. He denied his will and he obeyed God's will without murmuring, like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. So, so he opened not his mouth and did so willingly and faithfully. In John 10, verse 17 and 18, he said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority, authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Christ obeyed God's will willingly and faithfully. And that is through the Holy Spirit. Christ bore his cross. He obeyed, full, he obeyed the most difficult task ever given to man. And he did so through prayer. So through prayer, we should be able to do all things as well. And that's what our master, Jesus Christ, wants. As Christ thought about his disciples, who will follow in his footsteps, who will carry their own crosses as well, he knew that they will need this prayer. So he taught them this pray, prayer, your will be done. And when we offer up this petition, in accordance to what Christ has taught us. Think of how gladly Christ will bring this petition before the Father as our high priest. Think of how gladly he would say to the Father, Father, they are following in my footsteps. They are my brothers and sisters. They are my very body and my dear bride. Listen to their prayers and work in them as you have worked in me. Anoint them with your Holy Spirit as you have done for me. So dear brothers and sisters, as you go into your week, you will be given the opportunity to follow Christ, the opportunity to obey God's will, the opportunity to take up your cross. It won't be easy. It's, it's never been easy. There will be times when you wonder how how long can I keep this up? There will be times when you think, I'm so fed up with this. I don't care anymore. I'm done with this. There will be times when you'll be at your wit's end. There will be times when, after fighting against temptation for so long, when you just want to give up. Let's renew our vigor through prayer. Christ prayed, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he did that for our sake. Can we not do the same for his sake? And do pray your will be done. Remember that you're not left to your own devices. Christ taught us a powerful prayer to ensure us the power of the Holy Spirit. You can fulfill your calling by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. So pray continually, your will be done. Amen.